Welcome back to the MongoDB Schema Design Anti-Patterns video series. This is part three in the series. If you missed part one or part two, I recommend you watch those first as this video is gonna build on concepts presented in those. Today, we're gonna to discuss the final anti-pattern, separating data that is accessed together. After that, I'll summarize all the anti-patterns and wrap up with some tips and resources. Today's anti-pattern is my favorite one as it brings together concepts from several anti-patterns. Now, if you have a relational database background, normalizing data can begin to feel a bit like second nature to you. Your instinct may be to split related data into different pieces in order to optimize for space or perhaps to reduce data duplication. However, separating data that is frequently accessed together is actually an anti-pattern in MongoDB. Let's discuss why that is. Much like you would use a join to combine information from different tables in a relational database, MongoDB has a dollar lookup operation that allows you to join information from more than one collection. Now back in the very first anti-pattern we discussed on massive arrays, you saw me use dollar lookup to join information from two different collections. Dollar lookup is great for infrequent or rarely used queries, or perhaps analytical queries that can run overnight without a time limit. The problem with separating data that is accessed together is that dollar lookup operations are slow and resource intensive compared to operations that don't need to combine data from more than one collection. Let's consider why that is. When data that is accessed together is stored together, you can simply retrieve a single document to get the information you need. You aren't having to join the data together, so the operation is actually very fast. If you're familiar with relational databases, think about the speed of retrieving a single row from a table versus retrieving a row that was combined from several different tables, especially if those tables are very large with huge amounts of data. Getting data from a single row is much faster. The same principle applies here. Retrieving information from a single document is faster than using dollar lookup to join documents together from multiple collections. Now, I've said it before and I'm gonna say it again. The rule of thumb when modeling your data in MongoDB is data that is accessed together should be stored together. Instead of separating data that is frequently used together between multiple collections, leverage embedding and arrays to keep the data together in a single collection. Let's take a look at an example. Now, this is my favorite example in the entire video series. Leslie decides to organize a model United Nations. Now, Ben is super pumped about this. He says, I didn't really do model United Nations in high school, so, oh wait, I super did. So Leslie organizes the Model UN for local high school students and she recruits some of her coworkers to participate as well. Each participant will act as a delegate for a country during the event. She assigns Andy and Donna to be delegates for Finland. Let's say that Leslie decides to store information related to the Model United Nations in a MongoDB database. She knows she needs to store the following information, basic stats about each country, a list of resources that each country has available to trade, a list of delegates for each country, and policy statements for each country. She begins by creating a collection for each of the bullet points on this slide. So she creates a collection for countries, a collection for resources, a collection for delegates, and a collection for policies. Now Leslie wants to be able to use this data to generate a country report. The report should contain basic stats, resources currently available to trade, a list of delegates, and the names and dates of the last five policy documents. The Model United Nations event begins and Andy is very excited to represent Finland. He begins trading with other countries. He says, I've just traded all of Finland's boring stuff for every other country's lions. I've definitely got more lions than any other country in the world right now. So let's take a look at what Andy's data looks like in the database after he's done trading for lions. 
Let's begin with the document for Finland in the country's collection. Here we can see Finland's official name, capital city, official languages, and population. Next, let's take a look at the document for Finland in the resources collection. Here we can see that Andy has acquired 32,563 lions and he has no other resources left. Now let's take a look at the delegates collection. Each delegate has a document in the collection. Here is the document that tells us Andy is a delegate for Finland. And here's the document that tells us Donna is also a delegate for Finland. Next, let's take a look at the policies collection. A country could have many policies. Here is a policy for Finland that outlines their country defense policy. As you can see, Finland has formally decided to use lions in lieu of military for all self-defense. Leslie wants to generate a report about Finland. Now, as a refresher, the report needs basic stats about Finland, a list of resources that Finland has available to trade, a list of Finland's delegates, and the names and dates of Finland's last five policy documents. Now, to generate this report, Leslie would need to use Dollar Lookup to combine information from all four collections. That's not great. Remember, data that is accessed together should be stored together. Let's work incrementally to restructure our data so we can generate this country report without having to use Dollar Lookup. So here are the four collections. How can we restructure these? Hmm. Let's start with the first two collections, countries and resources. There is a one-to-one -one relationship between documents in the countries collection and the resources collection. We can embed the information from a resource document as a sub-document in a country document. Let me show you. So here we go, we've kept the information about resources together as a sub-document in the document for Finland. This is an easy way to keep data organized. We have no need for the resources collection anymore, so we can delete it. At this point, Leslie can retrieve information about a country and its resources without having to use dollar lookup. So we've made some progress. Let's keep analyzing the schema. We have a one-to-many relationship between countries and delegates. We can create an array named delegates in the country documents. Each delegates array will store objects with delegate information. We can feel good about storing the delegate information in the country documents since each country will have only a handful of delegates, meaning that the delegates array won't grow infinitely. Also, Leslie won't be frequently accessing information about the delegates separately from their associated countries, so this schema makes sense. We no longer need the delegates collection, so we can delete it. Now, let's take a look at the policies collection. We have a one-to-many relationship between countries and policies, since a country could have many policies. We need to include the titles and dates of each country's five most recent documents in the country report. We could embed the policy documents in the country documents, but then the documents could quickly become quite large based on the length of the policies. We don't want to fall into the trap of the bloated documents anti-pattern, but we also want to avoid using dollar lookup every time we run a country report. So we can store the titles and dates of the five most recent policy documents in the country documents. We can also create a manual reference to the policy document so we can easily retrieve all of the information for each policy when needed. So we'll leave the policies collection as is. Now we will have to maintain some duplicate information between the documents in the country's collection and the policies collection but duplicating a little bit of information is a good trade-off to ensure fast queries. So let's summarize what we did here. We updated our schema that was originally four collections and condensed it down to two. We can now run our country report without having to combine information from more than one collection, so our reports can be generated incredibly quickly. Let's summarize the separating data that is accessed together anti-pattern. 
Do carefully consider your use case as you design your schema. Weigh the benefits and drawbacks of data duplication as you bring data together. Don't separate data that is accessed together. Remember, data that is accessed together should be stored together. If you follow this rule of thumb, your queries will be incredibly speedy. All right, we have made it through all six anti-patterns. Let's review them. First up, massive arrays. This anti-pattern refers to storing massive, unbounded arrays in your documents. In this example, we talked about how to store information about employees and the buildings where they work. We talked about our rule of thumb when modeling data in MongoDB. Data that is accessed together should be stored together. Remember, we don't want to store information in massive, unbounded arrays. Next up, we have massive number of collections. This anti-pattern refers to storing a massive number of collections, especially if they are unused or unnecessary, in your database. We worked through the example where Leslie stored temperature and level data about local rivers every minute. Instead of creating a collection each day to store sensor data, she now stores all of her sensor data in a single collection. Remember to limit your replica sets to 10,000 collections. Unnecessary indexes. This anti-pattern refers to storing an index that is unnecessary. An index could be unnecessary because it is one, rarely used if at all, or two, redundant because another compound index covers it. We worked through the example of Leslie's website for inspirational women. We discovered that Leslie didn't need individual indexes on all of her fields. She only needed the compound index on her last name and first name fields, and an index on her hobbies field. Remember that indexes are good and increase read performance. Just don't create unnecessary indexes. At the halfway point, we discussed bloated documents. This anti-pattern refers to storing large amounts of data together in a document when that data is not frequently accessed together. For this anti-pattern, we continued discussing Leslie's website for inspirational women. We were able to restructure the data to optimize the query on the homepage and fit the most important data in RAM. Remember that rule of thumb that I keep repeating. Data that is accessed together should be stored together. Just don't bloat your documents with related data that isn't actually accessed together. Next up, we have case-insensitive queries without case-insensitive indexes. This anti-pattern refers to frequently executing a case-insensitive query without having a case-insensitive index to cover it. For this anti-pattern, we continued discussing Leslie's website of inspirational women. We created case-insensitive indexes so we could return all of the Harriets in the collection when we queried for Harriet, and not just the Harriets with matching capitalization. Remember to create a case-insensitive index when you want to run case-insensitive queries. Finally, we discussed separating data that is accessed together. This anti-pattern refers to separating data between different documents and collections that is frequently accessed together. We worked through the Model UN example. Leslie needed to run a country's report. Now, we began with four collections, and initially we needed to use dollar lookup in order to generate the report. We remodeled our data, so we had only two collections. In the end, we did not need to use dollar lookup, so we were able to generate our report incredibly quickly. Remember to carefully consider your use case as you design your schema. Data that is accessed together should be stored together. If you want to learn more, I've written a blog series that covers these anti-patterns. The series includes a blog post for each anti-pattern. You can find this series as well as a ton of other valuable articles at developer.mongodb.com, and I'll drop a link in the description below. Now that you know what not to do, I recommend that you learn what you should do. Begin by learning the MongoDB schema design patterns. Ken Alger and Daniel Kupal wrote a fantastic blog series that details each of the 12 schema design patterns. Daniel also co-created a free MongoDB University course that walks you through how to model your data. And again, I'll drop the links for both of those below. 
Once you have built your data modeling foundation on schema design patterns and anti-patterns, carefully consider your use case. Ask questions like, what data will need to be stored? What data is likely to be accessed together? What queries will be run most frequently? And what data is likely to grow at a rapid, unbounded pace? The great thing about MongoDB is that it has a flexible schema. You have the power to rapidly make changes to your data model when you use MongoDB. If your requirements change or you realize you haven't modeled your data in the best possible way, maybe you're saying, oh, this is bad. I should not have done this. That's totally okay. You can easily update your data model and you can make those updates without any downtime. If and when you're ready, you can lock down part or all of your schema with schema validation. Don't worry, the schema validation is flexible too. You can configure it to throw warnings or errors. You can also choose if the validation should apply to all documents or just documents that already pass the schema validation rules. All of this flexibility gives you the ability to validate documents with different shapes in the same collection helping you migrate your schema from one version to the next. So in summary, every use case is unique. So every schema will be unique. There is no right model for your data. If you have any questions about this video, feel free to ask them in the MongoDB community. You can find the community at community.mongodb.com. My team and I are there every day answering questions. So get pumped. Have fun and model some data.